Uh, I've got about a 50 year, almost 50 years in the business, and I started when I started in tele in video when it was television, way back when. In uh, about 1967, I graduated from San Francisco State, and immediately started working for Channel Four, Five, and Two as an assignment editor, writer, producer. Uh, and I never really got in the technical side of things or shooting until later in my career. Um, although I've always been interested in technical things, as you'll see here. Um, I'm fascinated by this medium, and I want to present to you the kind of history of how it came about. And a lot of us kind of remember that slide from the 50s, I suppose. But there's something that has a direct bearing on television and how it was invented. A 14-year-old farm boy named Philo T. Farnsworth was plowing a potato field in Idaho. And somebody said he astral projected himself above the potato field and realized that you could, mod you could create an image by modulating the rows as you went back and forth and back and forth. And he imagined that you could do this with vacuum tubes and a whole scheme of things. And he actually drew a diagram. That is the diagram and that was used in a patent fight years later with RCA and, and it was successful for him. He took that to his high school science teacher and showed him what, and talked to him about the idea. And the science teacher said, you know, that would work. Five years later, the Crocker family had him set up in San Francisco at Green and Sansom Street. Um, and he started creating the image dissector tube, and I forgot the name of the receiving tube, but the receiving tube, and uh, created the first electronic television. Um, that's another picture of Philo. In 1927, he showed the first images on, on the screen. In 1928, he showed a, uh, images to the San Francisco Chronicle. The Chronicle uh, wrote a article about it, and I think they published one of the pictures. And uh, immediately after that, David Sarnoff from New York, who ran RCA, um, sent out a Russian engineer to kind of poke around Philo's laboratory. And Philo, being a very innocent farm boy from the Midwest and the West, kind of just showed him everything. I think he even showed him how to blow glass, which Philo had to learn to create the vacuum tube. Um, so I think it was about a year, maybe less, uh, that uh, he was spent with, with uh, Farnsworth and finally went back to New York. Oh, that would help. Thank you. Finally went back to New York, and uh, uh, about a year later, RCA announced that they had an all-electronic television system. They didn't, at the time, have anything to show, but they announced that they had it in development. There were other experiments going on in England. Uh, there was the size of the cameras and always amazed me. Uh, there was another scheme using what was called a flying spot scanner. It was a mechanical method of reproducing a picture where you spun a flying spot. That actually, those series of circles was, were all set up in such a way, and I don't have a diagram here, that you could, you could shoot a talking head, basically, and, and transmit that. The laboratory, still exists on Green Street in Sansom. Uh, it's a kind of a soft slide, but it's there. You can go by it. There's a plaque out in front that was uh, dedicated. This apparently uh, is the first image of Pim Farnsworth, Philo's widow, who uh, was the first human being to appear on camera. They say she, they, she kept her eyes closed, but they don't look quite that way. Um, here's Pim several years later. And you know, I, I can see the smile in both of these pictures. Maybe I'm just projecting, but... Um, I had a really unique opportunity to meet Pam Farnsworth. Uh, I can't remember when it was. It must have been in the 80s. I had a small production studio in Mill Valley, and uh, in Tam Valley, and we had a contract with Newsweek Feature Service to do pickups every once in a while and then have an interview. And I got a call one afternoon saying, could you have a camera ready in the studio from the producer in, in the city? Uh, we ha there's a woman coming in who lives out in uh, Stinson Beach, and we'd like to interview her. This bright, lively woman walked in the front door, put her hand out and said, hi, I'm Pam Farnsworth. And she was carrying a cardboard box. And so we went into the studio. And I took the, uh, she put the cardboard box down and took out of it this object wrapped in a towel. And she unwrapped it and handed it to me. And she said, this was uh, Phil's 
image dissector tube. And I'm standing there on a concrete floor saying, I hope I don't drop this thing. Um, it was an interesting experience to meet her. Uh, apparently their son lives in San Rafael or in the area and is active from time to time helping promote his father's legacy and, and uh, memory. Uh, she went on and continued to really promote the memory of, of Philo. He, Philo himself in, had other inventions, one of which was radar, and the other of which was a baby incubator. I'm not sure how they're related, but he's got patents for all of those. Um, like a lot of inventors, he died penniless and uh, ultimately won the suit with RCA, but then went on to uh, found a company that started producing commercial t uh, television sets. And I guess that never really, probably RCA beat the hell out of them, is my guess. Uh, but there's still a lot of information about Philo out there. Uh, books for kids have been written. Uh, most recently, Aaron Sorkin, the uh, West Wing creator and writer, wrote a play called The Farnsworth Invention that actually has become quite controversial. It's quite an interesting play. The uh, Palo Alto Players uh, played it last year, and I went down to see it. And the Farnsworth family and Aaron are in a little bit of a dispute over some of the, some of the information in the play. Uh, it's an interesting play because he, Sorkin has both Philo and David Sarnoff talking to the audience throughout the play, reflecting on what was going on uh, at various stages in the development of television in, in the, early, the early days. Um, and I, you can go online and, and, under, and Google the Farnsworth invention and find the, the, the statement from the Farnsworth family and the statement from Sorkin that went back and forth at the time when, the, when they played it in uh, Palo Alto. I was traveling through, uh, through Utah, Idaho rather, uh, coming back from a fly fishing trip, and I looked over at the side of the road where I was stopped for a stop sign, and I saw that sign there, the Farnsworth TV and uh, Museum, and I decided, well, I've got to go in and take a look at this. I couldn't miss it. And inside they had all this memorabilia and objects and television sets and all kinds of things. Um, there's the image dissector tube right in front of uh, photograph and uh, just to prove I was there. This next video is kind of fun. The backstage preview of television, the newest miracle of modern electrical engineering. Technicians in the Farnsworth Philadelphia Laboratories have helped to make television the dazzling dream of the decade a practical reality today. Mr. Philo T. Farnsworth, shown at the right, is working on the image dissector tube, a photoelectric camera tube of his own invention that distinguishes his system of television from others. It is said to be responsible for the most clearly defined television pictures. Placed in the circuit of this receiving system is a funnel-shaped cathode tube. The round flat surface of its bulb becomes the picture screen in studio monitor sets as well as in home receiving sets. The image dissector tube and the cathode oscillite tube are the heart and brain of the Farnsworth system. Television engineers are now adjusting studio equipment to demonstrate the technical routine of broadcasting a television program. In this camera is an image dissector tube. The camera lens picks up the artist as an image of light, causing electrodes in the dissector tube to emit electrons. Passing through station equipment, the electrons become radio impulses to be broadcast and picked up by receiving sets where the routine is reversed. The radio impulses becoming points of light that appear on the screen as pictures. 30 pictures are completed every second. These pictures are composed of 200,000 light points that strike the screen one at a time at the rate of 6 million points per second. Music and sound accompany the performer's action, both visible and audible elements going on the air in perfect synchronization. As the action is photographed from various angles, engineers at control board select long shots and close-ups, editing the show as it passes instantly through the station's facility. Traveling with the speed of light through a maze of tubes and equipment, the show leaves the station's sending towers to be viewed by the television public, an audience as yet small and comparatively ignorant of the enormous research and experiment that makes it possible for us to see and hear people many miles away. We can even see the announcer, although that annoying necessity is still protected by distance. The camera swings round in the next act. While radio can portray the art of the ventriloquist, Television makes it possible to witness the magician's sleight of hand from a distance for the first time. Silent, invisible, instantly, 
human speech, music, and appearance pervade the airways together to be received in magic boxes for distant reproduction. It may not be long before all news events and current world happenings will be witnessed in thousands of homes. Television may picture for those at home the work of far-off explorers, or it may reveal to military officials the details of distant maneuvers. The most fanciful dream of mankind is today a startling reality, destined to become the world's most popular science. That was probably sometime in the mid-30s, mid to late 30s. Um, this is how big television cameras finally got to be about the time I was uh, getting or growing up. Uh, but they all had to be connected to the control room and each, each module there was a pretty large sized piece of equipment for each camera. Um, RCA introduced television at the World's Fair in 1939 in New York. Um, when I was a kid, I started modeling TV cameras in my basement. That, that box on the left is my vision of what a TV camera might look like in a studio. I tried to get one of my cousins to get in front of the camera and get her to lip sync so I could play television. Bit impetuous. Um, I also had an electronics workshop where I built heath kits and ham radio gear and a bunch of things. So I had both a production and a technical uh, background in the business. That's about the size of the camera when I was growing up. I used to enjoy watching several shows that took the cameras outside the studio. For me, it was really important to use electronic television outside in the world so we could see, see the world differently than we do on film or in different ways. And these shows would do, typically Gary Moore would do a show from Florida or Hawaii, and the same thing with Arthur Godfrey. Uh, Dave Garraway was sort of everybody's hero. He had a show called Wide Wide World on Sunday afternoon. That was just a series of, of segments, not unlike Evening Magazine, by the way, if anybody remembers Evening Magazine. Um, and it was a series of live segments. They did one with a ballet group on the Golden Gate Bridge. They did another one. I, they were all over the country. I remember watching something on a farm in the Midwest. But interestingly enough, when Evening Magazine came along, with a very similar concept in a way, the first producer shooter on that that program in the Bay Area was a guy named Scott Gibbs, whose father was the director of Wide Wide World in Chicago years earlier. So there's a direct link there. I can't find that fascinating. Uh, the Today Show with Garraway used to go outside the studio, and they still do today, every morning, no matter what the weather. That's what cameras looked like when I was in college. And uh, that was just a part of it. That went back into about a refrigerator size rack in the, in the control room in the back that had all the tubes and the amplifiers to be able to get that signal into the, into the control room where you could then switch between cameras. And notice that those, those monitors are, are pretty big. They're like old television sets with cathode ray tubes. As a result, you had to have a lot of air conditioning in studios. And so the whole ability to go out on location was you were kind of hampered. You couldn't really go out easily. When I was in junior college in San Bernardino, we got a grant to do a job retraining series, educational series, and that former bread truck would get, uh, we would go out on location all day long. This was during a summer, one summer. And the interesting thing is, in order to tape, to record anything, we had to roll into the back of that truck a two inch tape recorder. And there's a two inch Ampex tape recorder holding two inch thick, wide tape and they would disconnect it, roll it into the truck, we'd go out and shoot till about four in the afternoon, they'd roll it back so that they could play the PBS, well then it was NET programming back on the air on Channel 24 that evening. The next morning we'd roll it back in again. It wasn't too portable. But somebody once used to say that any broadcast equipment that had a handle was portable. I think you've heard that before. Uh, the first video tape recorder came about in 1955 and it was developed down here in Redwood City. So we really have a have a lock on the emerging technology. I mean, if you look even at iPhones today, I mean, we, the Bay Area is, is the, the invention capital of the planet, and certainly with television. Uh, one of the people who designed, the, the, the person who designed the audio section of the uh, first videotape recorder was Ray Dolby. And we all probably own something that has a Dolby label on it for somewhere for the audio. Um, 
Alexander, Alexander Pontioff was the founder of Ampex, and there's the first experimental VR1 that got shipped. But that wasn't the only thing that got shipped in those days. The head assembly that the tape went through was about that big. And in the first early days, if they wanted to record a show in New York and play it back in LA, they would literally ship the head along the head assembly along with the tape so it would match up out to Hollywood so they could play the tape back on the air. They eventually standardized things. Uh, the, um, this is a video coming up now that I think you'll enjoy. It was done, it's, it was done about 52 or 53. I, I, I forgot right now, but you'll get a kick out of it. And it again points out the San Francisco involvement. CBS Television and the Broadcast Network present the distinguished reporter and news analyst Edwin R. Morrow in See It Now, a document for television based on the week's news and told in the voices and faces that made the news. Edited by Mr. Morrow and Fred W. Friendly, a public service of the CBS Television Network. Now speaking from the actual control room of Studio I wonder if that's Don Pardo. Now, Edwin R. Morrow. This is an old team trying to learn a new trade. When we started this series of programs, we had to decide where to do it from. We decided to do it right here from the studio. My purpose will be not to get in your life any more than I can, to lean over the cameraman's shoulder occasionally and say a word which may help to illuminate or explain what is happening. We have here two monitors which will serve in effect the purpose of loudspeakers. They're tied, so to speak, to lines that come in from Chicago, New York, Washington, various other places. We will from time to time show film on those monitors as well. We are, as newcomers to this medium, rather impressed by the whole thing. Impressed, for example, that I could turn to Don Hewitt here and say, uh, Don, will you push a button and bring in the Atlantic Post? Uh, this is camera one at a point of vantage on Governor's Island. We're looking down into New York Bay on the Atlantic. There you have the east coast of the United States. Now on monitor two, May we have the Pacific Coast, please? Hello, New York. This is the Golden Gate, the waters of San Francisco Bay leading out to the Pacific Coast. It's rather hazy out here, Mr. Morrow. That's fine, San Francisco. Uh, may we have the uh, San Francisco Bay Bridge, please? OK. Now, uh, San Francisco, could you use uh, what you call, I think, a zoomar lens and close in on the bridge a little? Roger. We, for our part, are considerably impressed. For the first time, man has been able to sit at home and look at two oceans at the same time. That was the state of the art of video technology just 30 years ago. 45 years ago. I produced this in 1980. This little insert here, so you got to. venture out of the studio very often. In the first two thirds of video's history, from the early 1950s to the late 60s, electronic images from outside of the studio required armies of technicians and tons of equipment not to mention hundreds of amps of electricity. Today, we take the minicam for granted. As we see images of Russian army troops in full color really marching nice. through the streets of Kabul, it's hard to imagine a time when it took almost the entire resources of a network, not to mention the phone company, to get black and white video images from one coast to the other. The lightweight, extremely portable color television camera of today, 1980, minicam, didn't come overnight. It went through some very interesting evolutionary changes. Originally, all television cameras were designed for studio use. The heavy camera head itself was only a small part of the total package, then called a camera chain. Six-foot-high racks and tube-type equipment were necessary for signal processing and support for even the most rudimentary black-and-white pictures. Location shooting required turning a 40-foot truck trailer into a control room on wheels to cover any event outside the studio. When color arrived in the early 60s, not that much was different. Transistors began to replace tubes and rack assemblies, but the complexity of color video processing was such that any size and weight advantages of transistors was immediately overwhelmed by the more complex circuitry necessary for color transmission. And so color camera technology remained in the remote truck to be used, again, by armies of technicians. It was probably the American political system that played the most important role in the development of what we now refer to as the mini-cam revolution. 
Back in 1964, the networks had to find a way to follow reporters around on the floor of political conventions. But Arelco PCP-70, a monster of the 3-2 color camera, was developed. Camera operators were probably recruited from the ranks of professional football players to lug these early portable cameras around. And remember, this was only 15 years ago. The next Holy convention crap. saw a refinement in portable camera technology. The PCP-90 became the network's tool for coverage of the presidential nominating convention of 1968. Both of these cameras, the PCP-70 and the PCP-90, had one major limitation. They both required a large camera cable to be linked to a very heavy camera control unit, which was necessary for signal processing even before the signal from that camera would be routed to a switcher or a VTR. True portable battery operation, again, required an ex-football player to operate the camera. The price tag of either of these cameras was no small item either, in the sixty to seventy thousand dollar range. However, production companies and TV stations did see the possible application of a smaller production type video camera, and both of these became the industry workhorses of their time. Color video images on location were heretofore remote bands feared to tread. In fact, one of the most successful video equipment service companies today was born out of the late sixties PCP seventy and PCP ninety camera technology, compact video. In a small garage in Burbank, the first small non-band-sized vehicle was built for program producers to move about more freely on location. At that time, portable high-quality VTRs just barely existed. The Ampex VR3000 was a portable VTR if you considered 50 pounds of dead weight with a handle portable. However, TV stations such as our own KQED here in San Francisco pioneered location shooting without a remote truck using what was then a black and white camera linked to a VR3000. The demand for portability was beginning. In 1972, I had the opportunity to develop an instant videotape news release service for the McGovern yeah. presidential bid in California. The requirements were speed, portability, and broadcast quality. Our goal was to record the candidate on location, giving a speech in the morning at various locations throughout the state, then duplicate up to 50 copies of excerpts of that speech on location for distribution immediately to TV stations for play that day. This was back in 1972. Pneumatic three-quarter inch did not exist as a broadcastable format then. One inch was just barely time-based correctable. And PCP-70 and PCP-90s were definitely out of our budget reach. We did accomplish the goal, Sorry and about doing that. so did one of the first minicam type of video coverages. With a modified Sony studio camera at that time, the smallest available reasonably priced color camera with broadcastable color pictures, we did several modifications. First was to remove the conventional back of the camera viewfinder. We then bought a Panasonic one-inch TV receiver and converted it to a video monitor, placing it in the front of the camera right near the lens. With a custom-designed shoulder harness, we had our mini cam. We still had to run the cable to a small CCU, then to an IVC one-inch VTR. We would select a portion of the scene we wanted, dub it through an old analog type of time-based corrector, and record it onto a VR3000, where we even used film rewinds to cut the individual tapes for each station. It all fit nicely to a VW microbus, and it amazes me today that the whole thing held together for some 10 consecutive days of shooting. It wasn't until the fall of 1973 that the first commercially available minicam in the under $30,000 range became available. Hidden away in a quiet corner of the 1973 NAB convention in Washington, D.C. was a Japanese company called Asaka. They had on display a broadcast quality color camera with a camera head that weighed only 14 pounds a backpack of 14 pounds. In 1974 and 75, I worked with the Asaka in Hawaii and Alaska and in the western United States, and it was exhilarating not to need a control room on wheels to shoot color video images almost anywhere. Simultaneously with the ACC 5000 from Asaka, CBS News was working with Ikigami developing a mini cam. The HL33 came on the scene first as an experiment of CBS News with an East Coast unit and a West Coast unit. Incidentally, the HL in HL33 stood for the name Handy Looking, which was actually on the nameplate of the first CBS camera. The point to remember here is that those two model cameras were introduced to the world only six years ago. 36 or something, whatever it is. Minicams are a very recent development in our video technology. RCA was next on the scene in the mid-70s with a totally self-contained color video camera, the TK76. This was probably the camera that revolutionized TV news and electronic field production. The TK-76 immediately became the workhorse of the television industry at the station level. It also made possible a tremendous growth of independent production. 
Finally, when coupled with the equally rapidly developing video cassette technology, true film style video production was possible. A two person team could now go out and shoot video images almost as portably as film. The days of remote trucks were finally over. Since the TK76, there have been refinements and developments by over a dozen manufacturers making high quality and portability much easier. In less than five years, Minicam technology has changed the fabric of television news gathering and created a whole new industry of electronic field production. To any student of the future distribution technology, it is readily apparent that the Minicam revolution of the late 70s is the forerunner of the communications revolution of the 80s. For only with the higher quality, less expensive, and more portable image gathering technology are we going to be able to feed the ferocious appetite of the distribution challenges ahead. Satellites, cable TV, home cassettes, and discs. This technology is creating a demand for programming unequaled in the history of the television medium. Now that we're inundated by VHS, Beta, DiscoVision, Umatic, One Inch, Quad, computers, digital effects, handheld cameras, frame synchronizers, noise reduction, electronic still store, and on and on and on, well, maybe now it's a good time to pause for a moment and reflect on the words of a communicator spoken more than 30 years ago when he came face to face with the new technology. We're impressed with the importance of this medium. We shall hope to learn to use it and not to abuse it. Good afternoon and good luck. Yeah, that was done in 1980, so going to add a few years to it, like 35. Um, the uh, when we did the McGovern campaign, I was proud to say that the New York Times called it a major political weapon. And uh, it, was a, it was a fun little, little project. It wasn't quite a mini cam because we were still connected to a truck, but we were like the next stage was when we got the Osaka camera. Uh, video editing had to come along with camera development because when you start shooting outside, you had to bring it in and do something with it. The first video editing, videotape editing, was done on a little block uh, where you actually had to uh, put iron oxide suspended in alcohol on one edge of the tape, look through a, uh, through a um, microscope, and make a cut right between two little places where the iron oxide particles kind of got clumped together. And if you were lucky, the picture didn't roll. If you weren't lucky, it would roll. But most people don't realize the uh, original Laugh-In show was hand-edited on uh, machines such as this. And Harris can probably remember this, too. Uh, when CBS would do a, a game uh, out, uh, out of San Francisco, a football game, they would send an editor from New York who would take that splicing block in a seat next to him on the airplane that they paid for, fly him out to KPIX. They would rent one machine out of five in a bank back there and have Telco send out a feed of the game. And the editor would hand edit the halftime show and the postgame show and have to have it ready by then. That, I consider that a pretty major feat. Uh, there's one of the original Ampex uh, two-inch machines. Here is the uh, first walk down the street, shoot color video that we can document, that anybody can document, and that's me on the left, and my partner Harry Mathias on the right. And uh, I'm carrying the 50-pound VR3000 on my back, which is probably why I hunch over today. <laughs> Uh, Harry has got both uh, brought a 15-pound camera head, I think maybe even a little heavier, uh, and the backpack and the battery belt. And after the presentation, I'm going to show you the actual units that you see there that I brought with me tonight from the Bay Area Broadcast Museum. There's the VR3000. It had 20-minute loads, and it had 2-inch wide tape. And the battery was about, it was like a motorcycle battery. Um, then one inch came along, and that started to revolutionize things and get things a little smaller. That particular machine was created by a company down the peninsula called IVC, International Video Corporation. And it's probably the machine that revolutionized public access broadcasting, or cable casting. Because cable system, the, the uh, major suppliers to the cable industry at that time, Telemation and a couple other big suppliers, would go to a cable operation and say, well, you can have a studio just like KPIX and do all the things they do. We're just going to give you a miniature version of it with one-inch tape. And people didn't realize they were, that PIX or other stations were punching up network a lot. They were doing a whole lot more than just running tapes from the back room. Uh, there's kind of an evolution of, of video tape. I think we calculated once there were over 50 formats of tape that were developed 
from its inception with two inch on the bottom to DV tape on the top, and that's the end of the line because tape is dead. There is no more tape. I mean, we still use it occasionally. I still roll it as backup, but I record things on memory cards. Um, there's how memory has uh, gotten uh, in terms of computer memory. And in the old days, a, a two inch video, color video show could be put on a reel that was about that big with two inch tape and weighed, I don't know, 10 pounds or something. I can put a half hour color show right on this little card today and it's only gonna get better. Uh, there's the evolution of cameras in my career uh, from the one from college and the one with the mini cam and then now just shooting little DV cameras. And other cameras evolved. There's a, a probably a beta cam, um, digital DV cam. But what really revolutionized television one more time was this little camera from Canon, which was the first mini DV color camera. And it was an SD camera, but it was a mini DV. It was digital. It was the first time we could portably shoot digital very easy, easily. And of course, it has its own deck built in. You don't need the big. And there's an obsolete camera already, the one I own. Uh, I have to buy a separate memory uh, recorder to uh, put anything on a card. And cameras just keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and of course, we all have high definition video cameras in our cell phones. And now the GoPro is revolutionizing things, as well as drone, GoPros with drones. Anybody shot with those, that's really fun. Get some great stuff, but just stay away from the FAA. <laughs> and then finally, we have the iPhone. And interestingly enough, now you can buy lenses for your iPhone camera. And you can, I assume they have t telephoto and wide angle and various. New York Times just featured on that today. Do they? Yeah, OVO something. Hmm. Huh. Anyway, I'll look it up after. And now we're getting to 4K cameras uh, and super high, high definition. Um, about around the year 2000, I started seeing all these things like the Canon uh, Mini DV camera come out and I realized that we could probably find ways of switching between the cameras more efficiently than having to drive a big truck up to a location. And I was suggesting it one day to, a, to an accountant friend of mine and that I could build a little switcher in a suitcase that would give you all the functions of a, of a truck without the air conditioning because cameras were small and you didn't need it. And I remember the moment that he reached in his drawer and took out a credit card and said, I'll tell you what, he said, I, you, know, you think it'll cost about 25000 to build a prototype? And I said, yeah. He said, well, let me split it with you. We'll be partners and uh, let's build a prototype. Here's some credit cards they've been sending me. We'll just get started next Monday. Come up to my son's photography studio in, in Petaluma and I'll get you started. And we created a, I created a thing called a Pixbox, which was a 24-inch suitcase in a Pelican case that replaced, and I literally, you'll see it in a moment, I did a shoot where the previous year I had been a talent coach on a cooking series in, in Kohler, Wisconsin, using that particular van. It was parked back there. In fact, if you'll notice, there's a parking ticket on the van because it was parked in a bad spot. Um, and then a year or two later, I came back with the Pix box and got the same director who directed out of the truck to direct using my, my invention. It was a, a week after the NAB when we introduced it. Um, there's a, another shot of it. And I literally hand, hand built the prototype of that thing myself from my experiences as a kid doing Heath kits and building electronics projects. Um, <laughs> Jill Prescott's public television series, A Cold Cuisine, is seen on more than 100 stations nationwide. Charlie White is a 25-year broadcast production director. Ready, one, and take one, one's up. You know, we had a big 48-foot truck before. Now we have a 24-inch suitcase, okay? I'd rather have the suitcase, believe me. Okay, ready, two, take two. Introducing the Pixbox, the only plug-and-play live video editor. All the essential functions of a broadcast television control room in a small suitcase-sized package. At about 25 pounds, this new revolutionary TV production tool features a 17-inch high-resolution color LCD 
to show up to eight source inputs, as well as preview and program monitors on one screen at the same time. The preview and program monitors can instantly zoom to full screen without affecting the output signal for critical live editing directorial judgments. Timebase corrected switching allows a mixture of consumer, prosumer, and professional cameras to be intercut with plug and play compatibility <laughs> from either composite video, S video, or Firewire. Bright LEDs ensure proper audio levels. This unit meets RS-178 broadcast specifications for complete professional quality. Okay, we're getting some good video out of there. The audio sounds good, too. It's really working. It's really working very well. The PIX box includes an eight-station, two-channel PL intercom system, so the director has complete communication with camera operators. Also included is PIX Tally, a proprietary LED tally system built into the PL belt packs and mic feed to indicate when camera positions are live. The PixBox is perfect for webcasting, cablecasting, and or video recording live school sports events, local <laughs> community meetings, seminars, lectures, entertainment venues, hotel AV departments, recording studio sessions, church services, and all multiple camera live one-time only events. A patent is pending. The PixBox from Creation Technologies, making television content creation easier. This is a great product. After that, for a while, Charlie was writing for Broadcast Engineering Magazine. So he got a pretty good perspective on, on the business. Um, we got three patents issued, two patents, two patents issued. Um, and a year later, after we file a patent application, Sony came out with a unit called the Anycast. And I like to compare the two in saying that the PixBox was designed by a television production director and the Anycast was designed by a computer engineer who was consulting with a television program director. Mm -hmm. And you can see the differences. My screens are bigger. They're less crowded. They're a lot easier. If you're in an instant decision-making mode, you don't need extra stuff to look at. Uh, and you need large screens. We didn't have the resolution. Actually, the Anycast doesn't really when you look at it because it strobes. But several years later, um, I found an attorney who wanted to file a patent infringement action, and we threatened Sony with an infringement suit, and they finally, after about a year of going back and forth, they settled out of court with me and bought my patents. So at least I was knocked off by a reputable company. <laughs> That's the good news. Um, about three years ago, three and a half years ago, I was working, uh, doing a lot of talking heads that required teleprompting, and I realized that teleprompters were, get, were too big and bulky. And so I created the idea of a small, easy to mount. Um, most teleprompters then were mounted underneath the camera, between the camera, between the tripod and the, and the camera, which I consider to be sacred space down there for a camera operator. Uh, and I came up with the idea of mounting it using the, the accessory shoe that's on top of every video camera that's ever shipped. Uh, we were able to we were able to get a patent on that. It was granted last this past November. There are three other patents that are pending relating to development of the prompt box, as we call it. Um, one is now a foldable version, so the ship's really small. Uh, it turns out that um, somebody here bought one. Uh, one of the guys here was telling me he bought one of ours. We're in the, uh, one of the versions Hello. is, whoops. My name is Neil Tanner. Well, I'll play this. I'm a prompter operator based out of San Francisco, California. I've been doing this for 20 years now, and I've been able to travel the world doing this. I love the fact that I get to meet great new people everywhere I go. There's always a great crew. There's always great talent to work with, whether they're CEOs or politicians or people that have never even used a teleprompter before. It's just a joy to be in this industry. One of the other things that I really enjoy about it is just that I'm constantly learning about new equipment. And something that I just came across is this system called the Prompt Box. And it's a little bit of a paradigm shift because we're so used to teleprompters having big, huge mirrors, and you have to them, <coughs> and there's cables running off them, and you're in a studio situation. Well, with this system, I'm able to just put a tiny little tablet inside of here. In fact, this is actually my phone. I'm able to put this inside here and be able to walk around with this thing. It's as simple as, you know, hi, okay, great, I'm now teleprompting you. It's as simple as that. I'm also able to use this on Steadicam, 
And so if I wanted to, I can actually mount this on a Steadicam system within a few minutes. Having mounted on Steadicams before, I know that there's a very tricky section around balancing the camera with their whole system of battery and wireless and everything else like this. This is such a simple system. The times that I've used this with other Steadicam operators, they're just like, okay, we've got to buy one of these. It's a perfect system for when our clients at the last minute tell us, oh, Steadicam and teleprompter. It doesn't have to be impossible. So I've got three devices here. I've got um, all three of these fit very easily inside this device. Uh, you know, there's there's a you know a phone right here that actually has a very simple software on it. Uh, there's there's a you know the seven inch tablet or smaller works great with this system. What I have inside here is actually uh, my personal Droid, which is a, a phone as well as a tablet. It's uh, it's absolutely great because you know it fits in there. You know I can use it, pop it in. Now let me share something with you. This software, what I was able to do was as simple as this. I just picked up the phone. I was able to dictate to it. You know, I just said, okay, this is what I wanna say in the prompter right now. I hit save. I said, let's go into script mode. I placed it inside the right in the center of it. Attach these two little screws. One on each side. Where you go. It's as simple as that. People are prompting. So I love this system and how versatile it is using very basic tools. Look at this. There's no wires running to a computer. There's no batteries being fed off this thing. It's just, it's a very simple, self-contained, great little unit. And I love the way the industry is going with this. Let me tell you a few things that I really like about this. It's versatile in that I can adjust this to different size of cameras. So if, say for example, I'm using not a DSLR like this, but like a larger camera, I'm able to move this whole piece backwards and forwards. I'm able to raise it up and down. Now this is a monopod. Um, it's great because, as I mentioned, you can do handheld with this system. But what's also nice about it is, is if you wanna have a little bit more steady shots on the bottom of this, is a hole and it's set up for doing quarter 20. So you would just take your monopod, you would mount this to it, and then you have a much more stationary system if you're gonna be doing interviews for a long time. One of the things I really like about this system is, is that if you're gonna be shooting outside, this entire box functions as a mat box. So you don't have to worry about as much about light leak and things like that. So you're able to just point this right down at the actor and have no interference whatsoever. I love this system. So that's the prompt box. I really encourage you to find out more information about it. And you can do this at their website. It's PR box for you. It's the uh, number four and the character you. And uh, it's prboxforyou.com. And I think you will, uh, once you investigate, you'll find out just some of the great uses to use with it. Thanks again. Have a good day. The, um, yeah. So you may be able to see, you can read effectively off of an iPhone. It surprised me when we first did it. So, and I, I did the same thing. I just dictated this in using app, you know, apples. And that's a freeware product, that particular one. Uh, we've been we've been in the B and H catalog for some time now, um, and there's several versions that we're coming out with. We're getting near the end. I like to reflect on what television is and where we've come with it. Um, you know, in less than 90 years we as a species have been able to create a, an instrument that allows us to extend our vision beyond our vision and, extend, and also time shift our vision too. We can play back things that happened in the past. It's just something to consider. Uh, I also think it's important that we using video and using television, we're able to look back on our planet for the first time in mankind's history. And it's pretty important. I think ultimately, you know, this view is gonna become really a, an icon of how delicate this planet is. I love this final quote that uh, Murrow once said, just because your voice reaches halfway around the world doesn't mean you're any wiser than it reached only to the end of the bar. <laughs> Those of us in the television business have to remember that from time to time. That's it.